Hey everybody, welcome back to See Elise. Today you're gonna see Elise clean. And crime. If you're new here, hi, my name is Elise and I love to listen to true crime while I clean my house and do my chores. So to kill two birds with one stone, I've merge the two you see. So every week I post a motivating cleaning video while at the same time I sit in a little bubble and I tell you a true crime story that's interesting to me. If you listen to true crime while you do your chores or while you clean, you should subscribe because I post a new episode every Saturday. Yay! Okay, so it is a creepy, gloomy fall day out there and I'm very excited about that because since Halloween is right around the corner, I wanted to talk about a murder that took place on Halloween. Today's true crime case is the Liskey Griffin family massacre. Yikes. <laughs> I've got my kitty licking his butthole makes a pentagram t-shirt on today to celebrate spooky season. Yay. The Liskey Griffin family was a blended family. William Bill Liskey, so we will call him Bill from now on, and Susan, maiden name Griffin, got married in 2001. Susan had two sons from a previous marriage, Derek and Devin, and Bill had one son, William Jr., who everyone called BJ. Bill was a retired Air Force veteran, and Susan worked as an office manager. They both loved the outdoors, hunting, camping, fishing, gardening. The family lived in Martin, specifically Benton Township in Northern Ohio, in a rural area on about 100 acres. So lots of land, perfect for an outdoorsy family. Everyone was adjusting well and attempting to live harmoniously in their new family dynamic, except for BJ. Trouble plagued BJ from an early age and it only got worse after Bill and Susan got married. So William Jr., BJ, had anger issues even as a child. BJ was prone to bully other children and to pick fights. BJ's parents just kind of took this as, he's a rotten kid. <laughs> Discipline him and maybe he'll grow out of it. Unfortunately, rather than growing out of his naughty child behaviors, they accelerated in his teen years and he was skipping school, getting kicked out of school, and soon he was getting in trouble with the law. Now Bill, BJ's father, met Susan when BJ was 15. A tumultuous age for most, but especially for BJ. Obviously Bill and Susan were happy with the marriage because this was their second chance at love. Devin and Derek were fine with it. They were happy with their mother's second marriage. They're kind of like, yeah, cool, whatever, a normal response. But 15 year old BJ, he was infuriated by the marriage. He hated Susan for encroaching on his home and he hated her rules. And about a year after the marriage, Bill actually had to call the police to help because BJ was threatening to hurt himself. Unfortunately, BJ only got worse after this encounter. His angry outbursts became much more violent and his behavior became much more reckless. Now, everyone in the Liskey Griffin family's life had nothing but glowing things to say about Susan. She was very kind, very sweet. She was very loving and she was a wonderful mother. It just seemed like BJ just couldn't accept the change to his family dynamic. He didn't care if Susan and Derek and Devin were nice people. He just did not want them there. He didn't want anything to do with a step family. And Susan's just trying to navigate the new blended family, the new dynamic, like, hey, here are the rules, here are the expectations for the house now that we're all gonna be living together. And BJ was just like, F you, you're not my mom. He didn't want anything to do with it. BJ stated that his anger towards Susan was at the authority she exerted over the household and that she tried to impose order over the house. Like, okay. <laughs> Sorry your stepmom has rules, dude. <laughs> Susan was frustrated with BJ's anger, his outbursts, and his absolute lack of respect. Rightfully so. And it just went on and on. It was a constant battle. BJ was always arguing with Susan. Bill was always arguing at BJ for arguing with Susan. Devin and Derek are always walking on eggshells, trying not to piss BJ off. Most of the time just trying not to be home when BJ's home, opting to stay with their father more often. It was just a really uncomfortable, stressful home situation for everyone. Then in 2004, during an argument with Susan, 17 year old BJ actually struck Susan very hard in the chest. So now it's become violent. Susan called 911, which ugh, that all must have been so terrifying. Like the step parent, step child dynamic can already be difficult enough to navigate, but then you add in a child that has obvious behavioral issues 
and then violence issues. And especially as they reach their teen years, BJ was 17 at the time he hit Susan and in all likelihood was probably bigger than her. So you've got the power struggle of the step parent trying to discipline the stepchild, but then you've also got the power struggle of the child being physically stronger than the parent, which is just so frightening. So BJ was charged with felony assault, but only two months later, another argument resulted in BJ smashing a coffee mug over Susan's head, stealing her keys and stealing her car. So she had to call 911 again, file a police report for another assault and for stealing her car. And at that point, BJ was given a mental health assessment. I would really like to believe that this was not his first one, I, I don't know, I couldn't find any inf information about previous mental health assessments, but I do know there was one done at this time. It was at this point that BJ was deemed unfit to stand trial, and he was also diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. So the state ultimately dropped those charges. Now, there was so much chaos at the Liskey home. So many police visits, so many times Bill was hauling BJ out of the house. So People were talking, neighbors were talking. It was at this time that it started coming out that neighbors were suspecting BJ of harming or killing their pets. That's a big red flag. So now after the charges were dropped and BJ was deemed unfit for trial, he was sent to the Sandusky Group Home, a mental health facility for treatment. It was a temporary stay to get his medications filled out and to get the help that he needed. Now, even though BJ was out of the house and getting the treatment he needed and was away from the family that he had the anger towards, the violence didn't stop. He was still a danger to those around him and police were called three separate times when BJ became violent in the group home, one of which was an all out brawl between BJ and Bill, his father, when Bill came to pick him up for a home visit. So unfortunately it seems that the group home stay and the medications weren't doing anything to calm the violence in BJ. But Bill, BJ's dad, was just trying to do his best. He's just trying to do what's best for BJ get him into the group home, get him all his medications. He's just trying to help. It's his only son. So when BJ's treatment at the group home was over, Bill brought him home, back to the family home, and was gonna try and help him and keep him on his medications and help him get through this difficult time. However, absolutely nothing changed. And not long after BJ's return home, BJ attacked Susan while she was in the shower. Now it was released, I couldn't find any info about the nature of the attack, but most of the sources that I read imply that it was not a sexual attack in nature. But it seems more that he cornered her in a very vulnerable state in the shower and tried to injure her. Now, Susan was able to fend him off and get out of the shower and out of the bathroom, but she was left totally traumatized. I mean, that's so scary. Like, you're vulnerable, you're naked, you're in the shower, trapped, you're slippery, and someone's trying to hurt you. So she absolutely was not safe in the house, like, 100% of the time when BJ was there. So it was at this point that that was the last straw for Bill, and he kicked BJ out of the house and said, you cannot live here, it's not safe for the family, so BJ had to go back to the group home. BJ was 18 at this point, so he was on his own. Even though Bill did kick BJ out of the house, he didn't kick him out of his life. BJ continued living at the group home, continued seeing his psychiatrist and taking his medications, but he began an unfortunately common cycle of beginning to feel better, thinking, I'm feeling better, I don't need these medications, going off of the meds that have lots of side effects. And then as he started to feel crummy again, he would self-medicate with alcohol and drugs until he got himself into trouble and then would go back on the medications again. This cycle continued for a couple of years. Then when BJ was 20 years old, his psychiatrist deemed him a danger to himself and to others and had him hospitalized. But Bill wasn't prepared to give up on his son and he didn't want to see him stuck in a hospital for the rest of his life. So he actually went to the courts and applied for guardianship of BJ. Despite him being a legal adult, BJ needed a legal guardian so that he wouldn't have to be forced into hospitalization forever. So Bill could be his guardian and BJ could continue living in the group home and Bill would be responsible for him to make sure that he got his psychiatrist visits and his medication that he needed. And you can't blame the guy. I mean, you want to do what's best for your kid. You want to protect your child. And deep down, he did not think that his son was capable of harming him. So that became the new routine, the new dynamic. BJ living at the group home, but he was able to come home and visit. But it was always awkward. The stepbrothers would make a point to just not be there when BJ was coming home. And he just made everybody uncomfortable. Not only that, but the neighbors continued reporting missing and dead pets when BJ was visiting. 
Not great. So in an effort to keep BJ away from the step family and from the neighbors and the neighbors' pets, Bill started taking BJ more on like guys trips out to their hunting cabin to go hunting together, have some father-son time. You know, son, we can't have you killing the neighbor dogs, right? Let's go hunt some deer instead. Yeah? Great. <laughs> Bill thought the cabin plan was just what he needed to do to maintain a relationship with his son, but then keep the rest of his family and the neighbor dogs safe. Bill and BJ went on a week-long hunting trip up to the cabin together that concluded on October 30th, 2010. They drove back to the Liskey home on the morning of October 30th so Bill could help Susan set up for a Halloween party they were having that night. Halloween landed on Sunday that year, so they were having a little party with friends and some cocktails on Saturday night before Halloween, like you do when you wanna do some booze in. Now normally the family rule was that BJ was not allowed alone in the house and he was not allowed to sleep over. But since it was a party, and there was gonna be alcohol, Bill and Susan decided to bend the rules for this night and allow BJ to sleep over on the pullout sofa in the living room because they didn't wanna drive him back to the group home after the party around midnight when they'd been drinking. That's, that's not the move. Derek, the oldest son, who was 23 at the time, he did sleep at the house that night, but it was said that he didn't attend the party because BJ was there. He didn't want to hang out with BJ. He didn't like the guy. He made him uncomfortable. Devin, 16 years old at this point, ended up staying at his father's house that night. So he wasn't anywhere near the party and he didn't sleep there that night. And that brings us to Sunday, October 31st, Halloween, 2010. Devin, again, he's 16 at this point. He came home on the morning of Halloween around 9.30 a.m. just to change his clothes because he was singing in the choir at church that morning, so he just needed to pop in, change his clothes, and get to church. So Devin ran into the house, straight up to his room, changed his clothes, and then he's running down the stairs and he bumps into BJ right by the front door. And he's like, what the hell? It was very odd because he knew BJ wasn't allowed alone in the house and he also wasn't allowed to sleep over, but he sees over to the side in the living room that the pull-out sofa bed is made up, so he's like, now BJ starts up a little conversation with Devin. He's like, hey, what are you doing? Where are you going? How are you getting there? How long are you gonna be gone? And that may seem like a normal conversation to the average show, but Devin was super weirded out because BJ did not talk to him like that. He was typically described as gloomy and slow, but Devin is looking at him and he's like, why is he so upbeat? Why is he talking to me? Why is he happy? But Devin was in a hurry, so he just answered his questions. He's like, yeah, yeah, I just came to change. I'm, I gotta go to church, I'm singing in the choir, so okay, bye. And he left. Devin was like, that was weird, but whatever. Just went to church like normal. Meanwhile, while Devin was at church, Susan's sister, Lori, so the aunt, she was calling Derek trying to get a hold of him because Derek was supposed to come over to their house that morning to help his uncle with some construction projects around the house and he didn't show up. So she's calling Derek's phone trying to get a hold of him and not getting any answer. Then she starts calling Susan, trying to get a hold of someone and nobody's answering. Church ran a little long this week, maybe because it was Halloween and they knew everyone was sinning a little extra this week, right? So it was early afternoon when Devin came home after the church service. When he got home, the house was quiet. So he just assumed everyone was busy, weekend or Halloween stuff. And in typical teen fashion, he just went straight up to his room, shut the door, put on headphones, and played video games. Sounds like a pretty nice Sunday. Now Devin's up playing in his room, and then he realizes his phone's ringing, and it's his Aunt Lori. And she tells him, where is everybody? I've been calling Derek and Susan all day. I can't get a hold of anybody. Are you home? What's happening? Immediately, Devin has a very sinking feeling. I haven't seen anybody. Where is everyone? So Devin ends up going downstairs, calling out for his mom, and he realizes the house is eerily quiet. So he's on the main floor by the kitchen and he sees that his parents' bedroom door is closed. Their bedroom's on the main floor. Devin goes into their bedroom to investigate and he finds that his stepfather and his mother are still in their bed. It's the middle of the day. There's no reason for them to be sleeping. So initially he thinks maybe they got sick. Maybe they're taking a nap. He sees his mother's foot sticking out from the maroon comforter that's also covering their heads. Now he goes over to his mother's side of the bed and starts calling out to her to wake her up, but there's no movement. Then as he takes another step closer, he realizes that his mother's pillow is covered in what looks like blood. The first thing Devin thinks is, this is a prank. This is a Halloween prank. Not funny, guys. He knew his family often got into the Halloween spirits and his brain was probably just trying to protect itself 
from what he was actually seeing. This was not a prank. And as he took another step closer, what he was seeing came into focus and he started to pull a comforter down and he realized both his stepfather and his mother were dead in the bed and had clearly been murdered. His instant reaction was to scream bloody murder and bolt from the house and run right out the front door. And he called his aunt back right away and he said, there's blood, there's blood everywhere. Now Lori, the aunt who's Susan's sister, she was already worried. She was already looking for Derek and for Susan. So immediately she hops in her car and heads toward their house and calls 911. Now she must have lived close by because she gets there super fast and she's on the phone with the 911 dispatcher when she gets there and starts asking what's going on, where's the blood, what's happening. So you can hear on the 911 call Lori going into the bedroom to see the horrifying scene for the first time. And she tells the dispatcher they've got to be shot or stabbed or something. Now Lori goes outside to comfort a horrified Devin and wait for the police to get there. What's even more horrifying is that Derek was actually home and he was also dead in his bed. And in Devin's panic to get out of the house, he didn't even think to look for his brother. When police arrived, they found Bill and Susan in their bed, dead. Now Bill, I'm sorry, had been shot in the head and the face five times with a 22 caliber from about one to two feet away. And he was still lying in a comfortable sleeping position. Susan had been shot in the head three times with a 22 caliber, but her body was more sprawled on the bed under the comforter and it appeared that she had been moved. And horrifyingly enough, autopsy later revealed that Susan was also sexually assaulted after she was killed. So that's awful. Upstairs, Derek was found in his locked bedroom and he was lying in the fetal position in bed and he had died from blunt force trauma to the head. A bloody claw hammer was found in the house that matched Derek's head wounds. And tell me why I got so hung up on Derek's bedroom being locked. My, my brain went completely off the rails and in the wrong direction. I was like, okay, so somebody went into his room and locked the door and killed him and then climbed out the window and scaled down the house and then came back in and killed the parents. But I, it didn't occur to me that it was like a bedroom door and you can probably just like turn the lock while the door's open and then shut it. <laughs> and this is why I'm not an investigator. Because I would do a terrible job. I would probably be like Stucky from that really awkward season of SVU. Bing bang bong. Anyway, so it was determined that the family had been killed one by one as they slept, starting with Derek and then Bill and then Susan. When neighbors were interviewed by police, they started to piece things together. And one of the neighbors told them that they actually heard gunshots at 6.30 in the morning, that morning, but they didn't think anything of it. As I was doing my research, I read so many comments on like videos and articles that allowed comments that were like, they heard gunshots at 6.30 and they didn't call the cops? <laughs> but like, you have to realize they lived in a rural area on a hundred acres that they hunted on. And like I myself live in Northern Wisconsin in a rural area on more than 60 acres. And especially on the weekends, I hear gunshots every morning. <laughs> so when I'm sitting there drinking my coffee on Saturday morning and I hear gunshots, I don't think, oh, there's been a murder. I don't think I need to call the cops. I'm just like, oh, turkey. But if that timeline truly lines up and they were killed at 6.30 in the morning, that means that when Devin came home at 9.30 to change his clothes for church, his family was already dead behind closed doors. And then he likely had an awkward conversation with the killer by the front door. And then the poor kid came home again after church and sat around playing video games while his family was... That is so awful. Now, obviously BJ is the suspect. Devin saw him in the home, presumably after he had killed the family. And even Aunt Lori, when she was on the phone with 911 while she was waiting for cops to get there, she called him out. She was like, his son BJ was here last night. They were gonna go hunting and they've had trouble with him, with the law, and he has threatened Susie before. Susan, her sister. So obviously BJ isn't there, he's missing, and the family's Ford F-150 that was in front of the house is also missing. Now BJ was actually found pretty quickly in the family cabin he had just left that he had spent the past week at with his father. A police officer had driven past the cabin just to take a look because he had a hunch and they had just left there. And as he drove past, there was the family's Ford F-150 right in front of the cabin. And there was BJ standing on the front porch, leaning against the post, smoking a cigarette. 
The police officer approached the cabin with his weapon drawn and called for backup. BJ was just smoking on the porch and his Subway sandwich that he had picked up after he killed his family was still sitting on the porch uneaten. Woo, that was exhausting. I could really go for a foot long cold cut trio right now. Jesus. BJ was charged with aggravated murder for which he would plead not guilty and be held for a $3 million bond. However, he quickly realized that Ohio is a death penalty state and the likelihood that he would be getting the death penalty was pretty solid. So at his pretrial hearing, he changed his plea from not guilty to guilty to avoid the death penalty for his three charges of aggravated murder. BJ was sentenced to three life sentences with no chance of parole. At sentencing, he apologized for killing his family. He said he was not in his right mind and he blamed his mental illness and Satan. Damn Satan. BJ was shipped off to live out the remainder of his life in prison, but instead on March 2015, BJ was found dead in his prison cell at the age of 29 from a self-inflicted wound. So I don't really know what all of that dodging the death penalty business was all about, but I guess Satan works in mysterious ways. That is the tragic story of the Lisky Griffin family massacre on Halloween 2010. The family suffered greatly at the hands of their very troubled, mentally ill son slash stepson. And I really do feel for everyone in this case, including BJ. I know he did horrible things, but he was clearly very mentally ill and needed to be locked up or, or something. But his poor father just didn't want to give up on him and didn't want him locked up in a hospital forever. And unfortunately, those decisions would end up having very horrifying consequences for the family. It's just a very sad case all around. I really hope Devin is doing okay these days. Devin did end up graduating high school. He married his high school sweetheart. They have children. He said that he's very happy that his wife got to meet his mother before she died and got to know her. And he says that he doesn't wanna harbor any resentment or anger or hate because it's just not the right path to go down. I wish him and his family the best in their life and that is fucking amazing. So rest in peace to the Lisky Griffin family. And I hope you all enjoyed this spooky, scary Halloween video. And I hope you all have a happy spooky Halloween. Thank you guys so much for watching. I've really enjoyed making these and tune in next week for another episode of Cleaning and Crime. See you next time, bye.